Um, I am Michael Saffer, Vice President of the Hyde Park Historical Society and one of the coordinators of the Hyde Park Book Club with Dottie Jeffries and Carol Beef, who are both here online with me. Um, we, we have a really interesting program tonight. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, I'm just asking you to uh, keep yourself muted until after the presentation is done. If you have questions you wanna ask during the presentation, put them in chat. Otherwise, after um, the presentation is done, we will take questions from the floor. So right now I would like to turn it over to Dottie Jeffries. Greetings and welcome everyone. So I'm pleased to introduce our guests this evening. Um, author Roy Richard Grinker is internationally renowned anthropologist and he's professor of anthropology at George Washington University and Editor-in-Chief of Anthropological Quarterly. Dr. Grinker received his BA in Anthropology at Grinnell College, his MA in Social Anthropology at Harvard, and his PhD in Social Anthropology also at Harvard. Grinker was born and raised in Chicago where his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, quote unquote, the Chicago Grinkers, practiced psychoanalysis and to whom he dedicated nobody, nobody's normal. Um, that dedication led to this event. Richard's familial legacy mirrors larger changes in the history of American psychiatry in which Chicago and Hyde Park played key roles. Grinker has also conducted research on hunter-gatherers in Central Africa, North Korean defectors in South Korea, and the epidemiology of autism. His book, Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism, was the recipient of the National Alliance on Mental Health. Ken Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Understanding of Mental Illness. Unstrange Minds was inspired by his daughter, Isabel, who was diagnosed with autism at an early age. And our discussion this evening is Eugene Reichel, who is the uh, University of Chicago Associate Professor, a cultural and medical anthropologist, a faculty member in the Department of Comparative Human Development and director of the university's Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies. He holds an undergraduate degree in anthropology from the University of Michigan, a PhD in anthropology <clears throat> from Princeton University, and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in social and transcultural psychiatry at McGill University. Dr. Reichel's primary interest lies in the anthropology of mental health, addiction, and psychiatry. His book, Governing Habits, treating alcoholism in the post-Soviet clinic is based on 14 months of field work in St. Petersburg among institutions dealing with substance abuse. The book examines the changes that have transformed the medical management of alcoholism and addiction in Russia over the past 20 years. His current research project focuses on college mental health in the United States. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so just to, to start us off, I, I, I wanted to start by um, saying uh, a couple of words just about how much I enjoyed uh, reading this book. Um, I teach a class uh, at uh, University of Chicago that focuses on issues of culture and mental health. And one of the first uh, readings we usually start out with is uh, Ruth, uh, the anthropologist Ruth Benedict's um, article, Anthropology and the Abnormal. Which I, I believe forms the, the source of uh, the first epigraph of the book here. And one of the conversations we always have around that uh, article is the sort of question of what, you know, what are the legacies, what, what still holds true, um, and what kind of work it inspires. And, and, and I have to say that this really um, stood out to me as, you know, probably the, the, the most striking development of that kind of uh, and up updating of the kind of thinking that, that Ruth Benedict uh, uh, pioneered among others in the in the 1930s. Um, so I, I really just and it was such a such a pleasure to, to read. Um, 
maybe a good place to start would be if you could just tell us a bit about how broadly you 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 came to write this book um, and also how you went about writing it specifically. Oh, you're, you're muted, sorry. Well, thank you, uh, Eugene, and thank you uh, to the Hyde Park uh, Historical Society and to Dottie uh, for inviting me and uh, making this event possible. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you. Uh, and um, I should note that uh, Eugene, uh, you were very helpful to me in conceptualizing some aspects of the book. But when we met some years ago uh, at the University of Chicago at the seminary, a bookstore a cafe and, and spent a, a lovely hour or two uh, on a very pretty Sunday morning. Um, I have long been vexed by the fact that I was supposed to be a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. Uh, my great grandfather, uh, Julius, uh, and I'll, I'll actually bring up a, a photograph here of him and share my uh, my screen so you can see my great grandfather Julius. Can you all see that? Yes. Good. Yes. Uh, he practiced psychoanalysis uh, in Chicago uh, beginning in about 1910, so very, very early. Uh, he was also a psychiatrist and a neurologist. And then my grandfather, uh, Colonel uh, Roy Grinker, his son, uh, was a psychiatrist. And then my father uh, also was a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, and he's 95 years old and still lives in Chicago on the near north side. And I also married a uh, psychiatrist. So I am sort of surrounded by it. And I, in some sense, I feel like this book is a, a way for me to atone for the sin of not doing what they wanted. Because I was supposed, it's not that I was just supposed to be a psychiatrist. I was supposed to be better than them. And I think that's why I didn't choose the field because I didn't want to compete with them. And I idealized my father and my grandfather, not so much my grand, great grandfather, both because I never met him. He died in 1927 or 1929, uh, but because he was a eugenicist with some pretty uh, unfavorable views uh, at the time. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I did badly in science classes and I did great in literature classes and I just sort of moved in the other direction. But what anthropology did for me, what anthropology does for us all is it provides a critical lens that is often missing from within disciplines. I used to think that anthropology was about going off and studying other people in other places. And that's true, but it's only half of the picture. The other half is coming back home, having been detached and seeing your own world in a new light. Sort of like when you go to Europe and you, you notice all of a sudden that the roads are, are, are narrow and the, the cars are small and you come home and you, you really notice uh, right when you land uh, back in the United States, how big everything is. Um, it's that shift in perspective so that we can look critically at ourselves. And so anthropology in this book, I use it to attempt to look critically at the history of psychiatry and mental health professions and the kind of ebb and flow of how we have created barriers to mental health care. Uh, the major barrier being stigma. And that's really the story behind this book, wanting to, 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 to tell that, that story of how we got here. And if, we're, and if we're on a good course in reducing stigma and in reducing those barriers, how do we stay the course? That's great. So that, that gets us, I think, into to a discussion of the, the argument that you make uh, substantively. Uh, the book is organized around three large sections. Um, and the first section of the book titled Capitalism is concerned with this question of how mental illness um, emerges as a category or as a way of, as a, as a concept or as a way of understanding um, over the course of several centuries. Could you walk us just briefly through what the, the argument is that you're making there? 
Well, I'm glad you brought up Ruth Benedict at the beginning, because one of the things that she said uh, back in the 1930s was that the abnormal is a variant of the bad and the normal is a variant of the good. In other words, we stigmatize those who don't fit the ideals of our society. And if we have developed our views about what the ideal individual is within uh, particular systems like capitalism and with ideals like those that de Tocqueville mentioned so clearly in Democracy in America of being independent, autonomous, accountable to oneself, living independently, um, then we are going to stigmatize people who don't fit that ideal. In fact, the first asylums were uh, for people who were not productive. And so people who didn't produce, people who didn't fit the capitalist mold of the independent and autonomous producer uh, were separated from families because they were a drag on productivity. It wasn't that in the first asylums in Western Europe, uh, police and government entities were bringing uh, people who, with disabilities into asylums. It was families who were bringing them to asylums and uh, telling the asylum keepers that uh, their family members were a drag on their economic productivity. And so over the course of the last couple of centuries, we've kind of maintained this notion that the ideal person is one who is not dependent on others. And this has created stigma, shame, humiliation, uh, secrecy for uh, people who are disabled, people who are dependent on others. And there is always, there's been this tension uh, that I've always felt during my life uh, between this feeling that um, in order to not be disabled, or in order to fit in and to not feel stigmatized or marginalized from our community life, we have to be independent. And the understanding that actually we're all dependent because you know that's sort of what it is to be human is to be dependent on others. And if capitalism created the conditions under which we might be able to marginalize certain people who don't fit that ideal, well, then capitalism can also alter that. And in fact, we see that happening today in which features of one's personality that had previously been disabling or the cause of being a social misfit, like being a geek or a nerd, that sort of, that sort of thing. You know, the, the computer nerd used to be the, the bullied, uh, marginalized person. Um, those disabling features have now been reconfigured as enabling positive features. And so in a sense, the economic changes of the last several decades have been kind of like a, a real revenge of the nerds, if you will. Um, I, I was struck by the, the second part of the book um, that's called Wars uh, that, that takes us through much of the history of the, the 20th century. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why, why it's focused on war and- Sure. Uh, that um, may I, not be yeah. obvious to folks. Well, I mean, there's, there's the, the bigger argument uh, there is that uh, wars are global stressors. Uh, and in times of war, stigma tends to decrease because we have a kind of understanding that, that uh, uh, mental illnesses and emotional distress in general in um, times of great crisis are expectable, reasonable, that people aren't abnormal, they're normal people in abnormal circumstances. Um, but I started the book actually to be entirely about military entirely about wars and what effect wars have on mental health. Because I believe that the history of psychiatry is not one of incremental steps, but of big bursts of knowledge that are created um, during wars and then long periods of forgetting that knowledge after wars. But um, I started it also because my grandfather um, had been a psychiatrist in Chicago when World War II broke out. And he, first of all, he wasn't very happy in Chicago. 
Um, he lived a wonderful life in Hyde Park uh, in the sense that he had fr good friends, um, other doctors at the University of Chicago that uh, he, he and my grandmother entertained at their house on, on Dor 51st and Dorchester. I think it's 51st and Dorchester. And, um, but there was a lot of anti-Semitism and um, he never felt that he was, as a Jew, uh, really part of an important group of people at the University of Chicago. And so when uh, World War II broke out, um, it kind of provided him with an opportunity to, to leave the United States. He went to North Africa where he ran psychiatric operations for a time in, in Northern Africa and Algeria and Tunisia. And, um, and to try and do there what he wasn't able to do in Chicago. And it was to move psychiatry out of the asylum, to bring psychiatry to the common mental disorders rather than just the most seriously ill people. And to show that in his words, I mean, I was paraphrasing his words, that people with mental illnesses are normal people in abnormal circumstances. And in fact, he was so optimistic that when he came back to the University of Chicago after the war, he said, um, uh, we've eradicated the stigma of mental illness. I mean, quite a premature statement, um, but he really believed it. And, and he left the University of Chicago very quickly after that. The, um, the, the story that you tell, um, th there's, a no there's a number of really fascinating stories here that have to do with uh, First World War I, World War II, and then the, the Vietnam and, and, and Korean Wars. Um, can you briefly, the, the, the story about the Korean War was, I, I thought, particularly fascinating because it wasn't one that was, as you mentioned, it, it sort of dropped out of a lot of history of, of psychiatry. Um, maybe you could just uh, tell us briefly how, how that plays into the, the, the longer narrative. It's interesting you asked me about the Korean War, um, Eugene, because I have done dozens of events since my book was published earlier this year, and no one has yet asked me about the Korean War. <laughs> so, I mean, it is, uh, uh, sometimes it's called the Forgotten War or the Unknown War, but that's not because we've forgotten about it now, which is what most people think. It's called the Forgotten War because uh, the, the media called it the Forgotten War when it first started, that Americans didn't really care about it. Um, and the American medical community didn't care about it that much either. Um, as with the beginning of World War I and World War II, the military thought that they could carry on wars uh, without any psychiatrists at all. And there were many, many uh, generals who would, you know, reject having any mental health professionals come anywhere near their military saying, we don't want any mental health professionals to make our boys sick. Um, so the idea uh, was that you could do without them. But in the Korean War, there was so much stress that the psychiatric casualties just continued to pile up over and you know, over and over again. And it was in that context that again, psychiatry began to flourish. Um, it was also at about the same time uh, that uh, we start that we um, started our involvement in the Korean War that the first DSM was published. The DSM one, 1951, had just been published when the Korean War um, began, um, and the DSM one was, of course, as I say in, in Nobody's Normal, uh, originally a military manual that my grandfather had been part of developing which then Harry Truman uh, ordered the military to adapt for civilian purposes. And so the Korean War was, was, was hugely important because it was in that context that we see some of the biggest growth in the mental health professions. Huge, huge growth. I mean, so much so that by uh, within a few years of the Korean War, 10% um, of medical school graduates sought residencies in psychiatry, huge percentage. And the best of the psychiatrists became psychoanalysts, uh, psychoanalysts, because that was considered sort of, you know, for the, the cream of the crop. And Chicago, 
became uh, one of only a few sites in the United States that where psychoanalysis really blossomed and where um, psychoanalysis became not only uh, a, a scholarly enterprise and a form of therapy, but a scholarly enterprise that ramified and pervaded to literary criticism and music and history and, and, and theater and all areas of inquiry. And this is another place where your uh, family story really intertwines with the, the narrative as well. Um, there's a wonderful, several wonderful chapters where you're uh, describing um, your grandfather's uh, uh, training or analysis and then training with uh, Freud and then um, uh, his work. I don't know if you want to say a few words about that. Well, this is what Freud always wanted, wanted to move psychiatry out of the asylum, to make uh, a mental health profession that was for everyone, not just the most seriously ill. And, and so that was a huge achievement. Um, and um, the first um, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in Chicago, like my grandfather, and in New York and San Francisco and in Topeka, Kansas, you know, these were the pla these were the places um, where people really forged that um, attempt to um, to change to change the field. Um, the problem for my grandfather in Chicago was twofold. Uh, the first was the anti-Semitism that he experienced. Um, the second was the fact that within the University of Chicago, where, by the way, my grandfather started the first psychiatry unit um, with 11 beds at Billings Hospital, um, there, there were really um, silos, disciplinary silos. And my grandfather had all these ideas, like uh, maybe you could... Uh, you could link sociology and psychiatry together to find out if there are social factors that influence psychological distress, or that you could use animal models uh, to, to help um, think about humans, um, or that you could uh, inform one disorder by studying another disorder. These were the kinds of boundaries that were kept uh, according to um, the stories that he told me, uh, very much policed. And that is why pretty much, uh, you know, right after World War, War II, he, um, he did, he fundraised uh, in Chicago, uh, got a lot of money from some uh, very big donors like Irving Harris, uh, and uh, founded uh, the Psychiatric and Psychosomatic Institute of Chicago uh, at the Michael Reese Hospital. And why the Michael Reese Hospital? Because the Michael Reese Hospital um, had become by the 19, uh, early 1950s, a place that was kind of seen as the, the hospital that was more friendly to Jews and European immigrants. Um, it was something apparently Michael Reese himself wanted, uh, though he died at the end of the 1800s. And, um, you know, my father uh, continued uh, my grandfather's legacy, but in a more sort of strictly clinical sense. What my grandfather really wanted to do, and this distinguished him from his father and from my father, is to create a biopsychosocial model of mental illness. Um, and so this very powerful, influential uh, psychiatric institute at Michael Reese Hospital was staffed with people who studied both the psychological consequences of medical illnesses and the way medical illnesses, sorry, the, the psychiatric uh, consequences of medical illnesses, but, um, but also the, the reverse, uh, to look at how body and mind influenced each other. And that was pretty kind of a radical move at that point because what had happened in the early stages of capitalism in the early asylums was a strict division between the mental illness and the physical illness. And we're still struggling. We're still struggling with that dichotomy. And I think it's also a lot of the source of the stigma of mental illness too. But that's what, what my grandfather really wanted to do.
That's great. So th that brings us to, to my next uh, question, which is really about this, uh, the third uh, section of the book um, that's titled Body and Mind. There's a really nice quote in the introduction where you write, uh, quote, our dynamic conceptions of mental illness ride on the waves of broader cultural changes. And when science or medicine does appear to le lessen the shame of suffering, it does so as the servant of culture, end quote. Um, so for me, that really summed up a, a lot of what you were arguing in the final section of the book. Um, and, and maybe you could say a bit about what you mean by this idea of science or medicine lessening the shame of suffering as the servant of culture. Um, maybe, maybe by talking a bit about uh, the, the role that you think sort of neuroscience on the one hand and genetics on the other have, have played in potentially uh, reducing or shaping uh, stigma around mental illness? It's a great question. Uh, I mean, it's a huge question that I spent a lot of time on and I please forgive me if I go on too long. But the basic argument there, the gist of that quote that you read is that we often think of science operating by itself and culture operating by itself. And we don't look at the intersection between the two. And this is why I spent so much time talking about things like how culture changed the way anatomists looked at the human body, how, um, how, the, how literature and the arts uh, in, in, in uh, the 1800s and the late 1700s in Europe um, changed uh, and really, um, really shaped our conception of schizophrenia as a split mind, which of course, you know, clinicians wouldn't talk about as a split mind today, but of course the word means split mind. Um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Faust, um, uh, Frankenstein, uh, the double, the picture of Dorian Gray, um, all of these things are evidence of a movement in the arts that informed the way that people working in psychological professions then conceived of the human mind. So um, what that quote suggests is that when we see science eradicate or uh, lessen or mitigate a barrier to care, mental health care, it's not necessarily because there's been scientific progress in and of itself, but because science has responded to something. And one of those things science responded to in the middle of the book, of course, is wars. It is because of wars that we saw this growth in psychological testing and the growth in psychiatry. Now, today, in the last couple of decades, we've had such a focus on the brain with this idea that somehow, if we reconceptualize mental disorders as brain disorders, we will remove stigma because a mental illness will become an illness like any other illness. You know, you break your leg, you go to a doctor right away, but you have a psychotic break. The average time from first psychosis to first psychiatric treatment for somebody is, in the United States is 74 weeks. The theory goes, if we could conceive of the mental disorder as like a broken brain, perhaps we would hasten treatment and people wouldn't be so ashamed of it. The problem is that science and culture work together. And so you can't have one without the other. And the more we, it, it turns out that the more we think about mental illnesses as brain disorders, actually the more stigma there is, the more someone is seen as um, uh, damaged, as fragile, as diseased, or as permanently sick. There's a certain chronicity associated with the notion of a diseased brain. And what I try to do in that third part of the book is look at the intersection between body and mind. You know, there's, there's this um, thing in the news recently, uh, Havana syndrome, uh, where people of various embassies around the world, Colombia uh, and Cuba, uh, report American embassy workers report that they have all kinds of uh, neurological symptoms 
that uh, people think are associated with brain uh, dysfunction due to some kind of magnetic waves or microwaves or some kind of terrorism. And anytime somebody says, well, you know, it could be that this, these neurological um, issues, these symptoms are due to psychological distress, there could be a psychological phenomenon there and people really freak out and they say, no, it can't be, this is real. This isn't psychological, this is real. This is the problem of body and mind where, this, where the disease of the body becomes real and the disease of the mind is somehow not real. But I can guarantee you, if we were in a room right now and I said to all of you that there had been a gas leak here earlier in this room, but we've cleared the gas leak up, they tell me, but if you smell anything or if you get develop any headaches or nausea or shortness of breath, please let me know. Several people in that room will start to feel nausea, headaches, shortness of breath, maybe even smell the gas. It's real, but it's psychological. And you know, even when you have a mental disorder thought of as a brain disorder and you have a method, a technique, a therapy that acts directly on the brain, that can be stigmatizing too. I mean, we have one of those, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, or the broader uh, scope of neuromodulation. Um, one of the most feared of all therapies. And yet it is the most effective therapy for treatment resistant and serious depression. There's a brain problem. There's a technique that acts directly on the brain that doesn't work to reduce stigma. That's excellent. Um, so you draw on a, a number of uh, important criticisms of um, the concepts uh, of, of mental illness and, and how it has been uh, conceptualized in in, um, in in European and American societies, really under under capitalism, as you are. Um, but one of the perennial kind of pushbacks, sources of pushback that people often get um, when making similar kinds of criticisms is this idea that one is somehow romanticizing mental illness, right? Or uh, disregarding suffering. Now, I don't, there's not a bit of that in, in your book, um, but I'm, and I'm curious about though how you approach those potential kinds of, um, those pitfalls or, the, or those kinds of um, uh, those, those, those tropes and those perhaps unproductive uh, forms of impasses in, in, in some of these debates that we often see. Yeah, I mean, I think we can look at um, a, a look across cultures, but we can also look across historical periods. Before capitalism, uh, people suffered just as they did after capitalism, but they suffered different. In the Namibian hunter-gatherers that I have written about, they suffer terribly, but they suffer differently. What do I mean by that? I mean that the way in which we stigmatize, demean, or marginalize a group of people is shaped by the society in which we live. And so somebody with um, a cancer in uh, Southwest Africa, in Namibia um, may be treated terribly, and yet somebody with schizophrenia may not be treated terribly. Um, I tell the story of a, a man in Namibia who has schizophrenia, but he actually isn't considered to be at fault for his schizophrenia. He's not considered to be, um, to be sick as long as his medicines are managing his symptoms. Uh, his symptoms are thought to be the result of spirits that randomly landed in him as punishment for something that is one of his distant relatives did. In other words, it's not his fault. So every society can find something to stigmatize, but what they stigmatize and how they stigmatize it um, varies across cultures. So this, we need to avoid this idea of saying, oh, you know, what the society that 
um, in which everybody's living in a joint family and an extended family, uh, people don't suffer. They do suffer tremendously, but they don't suffer in the same way. When the World Health Organization did its long-term multi-decade longitudinal studies of the um, severity and outcomes in schizophrenia, they found that people did worse, meaning that they had worse outcomes, they had greater frequency of psychotic episodes, and the episodes themselves were more severe in industrialized countries. And they had less, uh, they had much better outcomes in non-industrialized societies. London and Washington, D.C., the worst. Uh, Agra, India, and Ibadan, Nigeria, the best. This isn't to say that, uh, that, that schizophrenia is not a terrible disease in those places, but that there are certain social conditions that can shape lives, particularly extended families, to provide social supports for people with that particular disability. You pick another disability and it might not appear to follow that same pattern. So I, I want to make sure we'll, we have some time for uh, questions from the audience. But um, just to, to wrap up our conversation, um, the, the book is, is ultimately, uh, I think, a very hopeful one in that you argue that just as culture has created and shaped um, stigma around mental illness, uh, culture can be used to... to uh, Un, un, undo this stigma, uh, destigmatize mental illness, uh, and and different kinds of difference. Right? Um, could you could you give us a couple of concrete examples of, of where you see that happening? Well, one of the things that um, I have been particularly impressed with is how uh, neurodiversity, uh, which is really the the movement of autistic self advocates, uh, has generalized to people with all kinds of other disabilities um, to start to value differences rather than to critique them. We're no longer in an age of conformity. We're in an age in which we want to value diversity. And we have started to think about autism in a way that uh, is uh, one that is, is, is much broader so that yes, it can include people who are uh, incredibly disabled, very involved cases, people who need 24 seven care might be self injurious and nonverbal, but it can also include people who um, have, um, who, who, who are, are quite uh, fluent in their language and who uh, are, are capable of achieving a lot in education and yet have a lot of social challenges. And when, what we have done with autism has then generalized like a tide that's raising all boats to other areas of life. So in the book, I talk about uh, some of the companies like JP Morgan Chase. Um, I talk about the Israeli military actually. I talk about a cybersecurity company in Australia uh, where there have been autism recruiting and autism hiring programs to try and help people to achieve their goals uh, within a society that, within societies that have sought to hire people in their own image. And uh, Michael Fieldhouse, who is an executive at one of the cybersecurity companies that I interviewed in Australia, was telling me the story of how after he started the autism program, uh, a woman came to him and said she wasn't feeling very well and didn't think she was doing her work very well because uh, she was having some physical issues related to menopause and um, didn't feel like she was you know, on top of her, her, her work the way she previously had and wanted him to understand this. And he just, he looked, I remember him looking at me and saying, this is the result of the autism program. Because of the autism program, people now feel comfortable talking about the help they need, the help they're entitled to the help they deserve. In other words, that kind of you know, generalizing or the tide that's raising all boats. And what I end the book with is a discussion of how people in scholarship, whether it's the CRIP studies, fat studies, queer studies, and in everyday life are taking ownership of their own selves, defining themselves as they want to be defined, not how 
others will define them. And I think, you know, sort of the quintessential moment for me in my life was when my daughter, Isabel, who is autistic, uh, gave a graduation speech at high school. I mean, no one ever thought she'd graduate from high school. And she did. And she was asked to give a speech, first speech a disabled person had ever given from that high school. 3,000 people at Daughters of the American Revolution Hall in Washington, D.C., near the White House. And when she started to speak, people snickered. There were whispers. There were murmurs. Those are the sounds of stigma. And then she got to a point in her um, speech in which she said uh, something like, people with autism like me. And you could just hear the room quiet down. And she ended up getting a standing ovation. What had happened in those few minutes? What had happened was something that had been unnamed, enigmatic, and therefore construed as weird by these students, many, most of whom didn't know her, became transformed through her doing of naming and taking ownership of what she was and who she is and how she wants to be represented. And in a framework that over the past couple of decades, all of these kids had learned about as a non-stigmatizing condition. And that's an achievement. That is a huge achievement. I'm not trying to be a Pollyanna, but I am trying to notice uh, aspects of our lives that in which we have been making great progress. The student who stands up in front of the lecture hall of 300 students at George Washington University and says, I have Tourette's. I might say something that startles you or maybe even you find offensive just letting you know. The student who told me that the, it, getting diagnosed with ADHD in her freshman year was the best day of her freshman year because for the first time somebody saw that she wasn't lazy or stupid and needed help. Or the autistic student who says to me, I, I don't make good eye contact, professor, but I promise you I'm paying attention to you. Okay, I think, I think this is a, a, a great place to open it up to... Uh to questions from, from the audience. All right, I'm gonna change the view here to the gallery view so we can all see each other and talk to each other. Um, and I wanna thank both of you for the, the really wonderful interaction and discussion of the book. Um, I personally have a question to ask because the book club has been around for six years now or so. And interestingly enough, back in January of this year, one of our books was a book called W2 by Betty Howland, who is an author who has been forgotten for quite some time. And I believe, Dottie, correct me if I'm wrong, her book was written about an episode in the 1960s that happened at the University of Chicago Psychiatric Ward, which was called W2. And I believe and I was it was just, in Billings. It was in Billings. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so I was just interested if Roy knew about that book and that, that episode, because this is uh, the second time we have, in this book club, interacted with um, perspectives on mental illness or mental conditions or states. And the earlier time was by a literary author who documented her experience at W2. Um, and just a little bit of background, Betty Holland was um, a Hyde Parker. She was a mother of two boys. She was a mentor, a mentee of Saul Bellow and in fact, his mistress at some point. Um, so all this happened in the, that context. And mm. I, I'm just fascinated by the interaction here. And I don't expect you to know about that, but the book club people mm. who have been here for a while are certainly aware of that interaction, uh, that the University of Chicago is something of a, a center for that kind of exploration. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, that work. Uh, I wish I had. I, I would have included it in the book. So I'm writing this down. Thank you very much for that. Um, One of yeah. Let me. I'll just share my screen for a second. Okay. So that you can see. Um, let me 
And we have a recording of the event, Roy. We, I can send you the link to. Okay, but thank you. Her sons were the discussants. Right. So there is uh, right, the I book see. we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And um, this is the the blurb that we did. She was in um, institutionalized for a number of months. And she did win a MacArthur Fellowship in 1984. Uh, but sort of dropped out of sight after then. And it was only recently that the book W2 has been republished. So, so anyway, it, it, well, thank it, you. I'm just yeah. Amazed. I think I'm these are really, at, I'm sorry, these, these are really important um, stories to tell. Um, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and they need to be told equally, though, I know I should have mentioned this, there is the other story to be told of how people who um, were not um, able to access care at a place like the University of Chicago received care, or if they didn't receive care, um, perhaps at state facilities like Cook County Hospital um, that was popularly known as Dunning uh, when during the time that my grandfather lived in Hyde Park. I think we also need to tell that story too of what happened to populations that, uh, and communities uh, that weren't able to access the experts um, in, the, you know, in the major research centers. And you know, Dunning was uh, apparently a, a, a quite unusual place where people you know, grew their own food. Uh, they had they basically lived there for all of their lives and had some sense of community, but at the same time uh, were destined to live their entire lives there and uh, many of whom were buried in mass graves. So it would be interesting to sort of look, do a comparison and look at the parallels of what happened say at Billings Hospital versus what happened in some, uh, some other setting that wasn't in a prestigious uh, research center. That's not an answer to your question, but it made me think of, 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 of that story needing to be told. Yeah, well, and there are lots of stories needing to be told. And, and one of the things in W2 that Betty Howland mentioned was the fact that routinely certain of the patients um, in W2 were shipped off to the state institution because they were either incorrigible or incurable or for whatever reason. Um, and some of them looked at it like a graduation and some of them looked at it like a promotion. Uh, th those societies evolved as, as sort of microcosms. So anyway, I, I just thought it was a very interesting intersection of, of your book and, and that particular. Thank you. So, so we have other questions. There's one Dr. in the chat. Um, I see. I see something in a, in a, in the chat. May I address go ahead. it? Go ahead. Yeah. So I'll read it. Um. Uh. From Jean Jenkins. Uh, we think of IQ as on a spectrum, a normal curve, and might it be helpful to look at various psychological conditions that way? As something we all have to a greater or lesser degree. Anxiety would seem to be such a condition. Uh. Yeah. Great example. Anxiety. Uh. If I didn't have anxiety, I would get hit by a car, instantly because I wouldn't look both ways before I crossed the street. I have to have anxiety, but at what point does anxiety um, debilitate me so that I've lost my functioning, uh, lost my ability to sleep, to have social relationships, to have my work life and so on. And, and really that is where um, the, uh, I identify the spectrum in the book, Gene, as um, one of the key components in helping to diminish stigma uh, in the last couple of decades. You know, mental illnesses used to be categorical. You either had it or you didn't have yes, it. Yes. Um, and now it's dimensional. Um, the spectrum is, is an invitation to all of us that we all exist on a spectrum and almost all of us will qualify or meet the criteria for a mental disorder at some point in our lifetime. Uh, the spectrum has many advantages also in terms of um, uh, helping uh, clinicians to be able to look at change over time. 
rather than to say, you know, once this criterion is filled, you'll always be there, uh, that people change over time. But I think it's also something that uh, has affected the general population. You know, we hear people say when they're really neat, they say, oh, I'm a little OCD. Or I don't know if Eugene, you've ever had a student who told you they had PTSD from a particular class they took. And I don't think that they really think that that's OCD when they're neat, just a neat nick. I don't think they really think that they meet the criteria for PTSD from that class, unless that class really created, you know, this loss of functioning um, so, and, and, and sort of long-term um, suffering and uh, flashbacks and so on. But by using these terms colloquially, they are, in a sense, accepting that uh, they are more like other humans than less like them, that they understand that there is a spectrum. I, the, the spectrum is a key to, uh, to reducing stigma. So thank you for that question. I think we've got another one in the uh, yeah. chat. Uh, Charles Feldman asks, I heard a mental health professional say recently that we should call it prejudice and discrimination instead of stigma. What are your thoughts on this? I think prejudice and discrimination are one form of stigma, but there are many other forms of, of stigma as well. Um, and, um, you know, if you are, uh, I, I recently did a, a, a search on a big, uh, linguistic database of all the uses of the word stigma. There's stigma of divorce, stigma of, uh, uh, of early death in the family, stigma of adoption, you know, stigma of, of being too masculine or too feminine, or, you know, there's, there, there are um, many uh, ways also in which people stigmatize themselves because they internalize the values of their society. Um, so, you know, it's important to call out prejudice and discrimination when it exists. For example, the way that African men were treated who, who were um, self-identified as gay in the military uh, through much of the 20th century were treated versus white um, soldiers and officers who also self-identified as gay, or men with white men with depression who are treated clinically differently than black men with depression. But uh, stigma is a bigger term that uh, also can draw our attention to the ways in which uh, prejudice and discrimination are elements of a larger structure of inequality, a larger structure of, distrib of distributing um, uh, uh, identities and senses of, of belonging uh, across populations. Um, I mean, back to the um, psychiatry and the military, what do you feel currently is, um, the regard for psychiatry within the, our current military, um, and particularly the acceptance of range of issues among mm -hmm. those serving in the military. Um, I think that the US military has done arguably more than any other sector of American society to attempt to reduce uh, stigma as a barrier to care. Um, I think that uh, the fact that we had been in these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan for so long. I mean, think about it. Uh, uh, people who uh, entered the military two years ago probably um, were born at a time when we were already in those wars, right? Um, when you have this kind of extended period of time of, of war, there's no chance to forget. Uh, about mental health care. There's no chance to forget uh, about um, the ways in which um, people can develop uh, new mental disorders, particularly at the young age of most military um, 
members, which is, you know, 18 to 24 years old, which is when most mental illnesses um, really have their, their more frank onset. Um, I also think that the growth of child psychiatry has helped the military tremendously. Um, though they may be adults, um, they are also in many ways um, like kids because they are so young. Mm -hmm. And the great um, skill of the child psychiatrist, and I have to emphasize just how new child psychiatry is, um, the, the great skill of the child psychiatrist is to work with multiple uh, people in a network, the school psychologist, the teacher, the parent, uh, another therapist, um, uh, a coach, to be involved with a number of different nodes. And that's exactly what happens in the military, which is why the military psychiatrists I interview say, oh yeah, the best military psychiatrists are the child psychiatrists. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think that's had a positive impact wow. too. Um, but, you know, PTSD developed out of the Vietnam War. And, uh, and that, you know, is clearly a, um, had a positive impact in helping shape the way we understand that if somebody has the negative consequences of a psych long-term psychological effects of a traumatic experience, that it's not because they're weak or they're fragile and so on, and that PTSD is um, a framework that helps us um, see the person not just as having a disorder, but as in some senses a victim. Uh, military psychiatry, by focusing on external stressors, uh, takes some of the blame away from the individual. And whenever a society takes some of the blame uh, for what's happened, whether it's the spirit world for my um, colleague, my uh, interlocutor in Namibia, or whether it's uh, the stresses of, of war in Iraq on the soldier, uh, then we see that mental illnesses are not as, um, as feared and uh, they don't become a sign of weakness or um, low value. We're, we're less likely to morally judge that person. Thank you. Yep, um, Oh, here, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see the um, gay guard Chamberlain. Um, do you think Simone Biles' stance on mental health self-care is having an impact on reducing stigma? Well, I would just say that, that celebrities are having an impact on reducing stigma. Um, celebrities have had an impact on uh, the way we think about mental illnesses for you know a long, long time. Uh, whether it was celebrities in the mid 20th century who, who sent their kids who had developmental disabilities or Down syndrome to institutions uh, because they wanted them to not tarnish their reputation, or uh, when uh, Jane Fonda uh, in 1981 or 1982 uh, publicly talked about her struggles with uh, eating disorders, or I mean, all, all of these things. Lady Gaga and Prince William talking about depression and trauma. They, these are people we admire. And uh, if they are coming out and disclosing and taking ownership of their own uh, conditions and their own struggles, we start to uh, feel that we can do that ourselves. In fact, I mean, I'm going to go way back in history. I end the book with the example of Hester Prynne from The Scarlet Letter. Everybody knows that book, The Scarlet Letter, which Hester Prynne wears the red letter A as a, as a punishment for the sin of adultery. But it's an amazing thing at the end of the book because she comes back to the village that she was exiled from and she's still wearing the A. And even the really harsh judges say, no, you can, it's, you can take the letter A off now. It's, it's okay. It's been long enough. And she says, oh, no. And Nathaniel Hawthorne writes the words, she had ceased to see the letter as a stigma. And yet something of value. 
And so she decides of her own free will, she's going to claim that because it's a symbol of her endurance. And over time, the women in the village come to Hester to talk about their problems because they know she'll understand. She's been through it. And when they have dis, uh, any kind of distress, especially problems of the heart, as Hawthorne puts it, or love, they come to her to talk to her. Like she's a, you know, so we're sort of like the first Puritan psychotherapist. Um, that, it, that victory of Hester Prince at the end is the kind of thing that we see as, uh, that we see in the victories of celebrities who will say, that it's okay not to be okay, that it is at the risk of undercutting the title of my book, normal not to be okay. Can I ask, is it possible for people to not stigmatize, for people to go overboard and not stigmatizing someone? Because for example, I think of uh, uh, ex-president Trump as being a quite a disturbed individual and yet there are millions and millions of Americans who think very highly of him and would love to reelect him as president and don't uh, see him as having any uh, problems at all that should interfere with that. Well, stigma is different than dislike or hatred or um, having strong differences of opinion. Um, and we don't want to confound, say, the process by which we see a person experiencing homelessness on the street and avoid making any eye contact with them. And, and then they, they feel marginalized and invisible and ignored with, uh, with, with something in which a, a large community like a political um, sect or a, or a constituency thinks about an individual um, leader or representative. Um, when I'm thinking about stigma, um, I'm thinking about the way in which we blame somebody for their differences, in which we, uh, we look at their condition and we add on to it a harsh moral judgment about that condition. One of the things that my great grandfather, Julius, my grandfather, Roy, my father, Roy, and me, um, I, I mean, all three of them taught me, despite working and living in very different historical circumstances, is that mental illnesses are almost always a double illness. First, the condition itself, and second, society's harsh judgment. We may not be able to always change the condition itself, but we do have control over the way in which we harshly judge somebody, um, the way in which we make them feel, the way in which we exacerbate their suffering. So the parallel there to a political leader is not whether we should dislike someone or, or crit criticize them or marginalize them because we think they're doing harm. Um, the question is whether are we making a person who's suffering from a disability suffer more. In your book, you talk about the deinstitutionalizing uh, uh, of the uh, asylums when they open it up. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that the Europeans went differently. They, re they instead of emptying them, they reformed them. How well did that go or is, is it going using that method? Um, well, what, what happened in the United States with deinstitutionalization, you know, as you're, you're referring to this, is, is that uh, big cities became dumping grounds for uh, people who were released into the communities. Their families may not have wanted them, and we didn't have the local funding uh, throughout the United States to actually provide for the community <clears throat> mental health that um, John F. Kennedy had hoped for when he signed uh, the Community Mental Health Care Act in 1963. Um, in Europe, as you note, they did take a different course where uh, they um, did fund um, uh, state institutions and 
I can't tell you that they have necessarily fared any better in terms, always in terms of the treatment of people with severe mental illnesses, but uh, they have not had the same problems uh, with homelessness uh, that uh, the United States has had. And um, there have been certain kinds of laws passed in particular countries or within countries, municipalities, uh, for example, in Italy, uh, in which somebody is, um, is actually, uh, a family is, is, is really expected to take somebody into the family and the government provides financial support to that family so that the person is not in the institution. And we really don't have that level of funding in the United States uh, for social services. But it's really a, it, it has to be a kind of, a, I was making a sort of a parenthetical comment, but it, you know, what you would find in Greece or Italy or even in Southern Italy versus Northern Italy is gonna be very, very different. Um, wouldn't you, uh, uh, Gay Guard Chamberlain writes, wouldn't you agree that we tend to blame the poor for being in poverty? Yes. Um, there's a lot of blaming of the victim of this. And, and, and that's where um, looking at the underlying structures of inequality can be, um, be useful. In the book, I write about uh, Dominic uh, Behag's work in Brazil uh, in a poor community where kids in school who have trouble um, paying attention um, resist and their parents resist a concept of ADHD that is psychiatric or biological. They don't resist the fact that their kids have difficulty with executive functioning or that their kids have difficulty paying attention and working at school but they resist thinking about the condition as something that is the responsibility or the result of that individual. When therapists in the place where Dominique Beheg was doing her anthropological fieldwork, think about attention deficit disorder as the result of the unequal distribution of resources as the social stresses of poverty, as the social stresses of um, discrimination based on skin color, they are then more likely to accept a diagnosis of ADHD. And why is that diagnosis important? Because diagnoses drive treatments, right? You don't have a treatment without, any, without a diagnosis. It doesn't happen. And so the question is not what is somebody diagnosed with, but how do we conceptualize that diagnosis. And so, you know, when we look at something like poverty, when we look at something like um, uh, adver other adverse childhood circumstances, we're much more likely to destigmatize uh, that person and their condition. Recently, there has been some very interesting work in epigenetics. As I'm sure you know, epigenetics refers to the, not to genes, but the regulation of those genes, the way in which gene expression is regulated. Now we all learned that Darwin was right, you, that, and Lamarck was wrong. I cannot lose my finger in an accident, then have a baby with somebody and have that baby then born with one finger missing. In other words, we can't pass on to the next generation traits that we've acquired during our lives. But Lamarck wasn't entirely wrong because epigenetic research now is showing that poverty, the stresses of, of, of other kinds of trauma actually alter the physiology of the body in such a way that gene regulation uh, can be altered in the next generation. In other words, a predisposition to um, the psychological effects of trauma can be passed on to the next generation, not through poor parenting, not through some kind of psycho psychoanalytic or unconscious uh, uh, process, 
but rather epigenetically, in which case it doesn't make sense to, um, to think of, to, to not talk about poverty, to not talk about um, the kind of structural inequalities and adverse um, circumstances people experience in life. And by the same token, the epigenetic research suggests that it makes no sense to talk about mental Ill many mental illnesses as either um, biological or environmental, because what the research on PTSD from an epigenetic perspective has shown is that it's both. Any other questions or? In your book, you talked about the Eagleton affair where he had to withdraw from the uh, vice presidency because of his past mental illness. Do you think somebody with that condition would be able to serve as like in that position now? Yeah, that is a great question. In, in the book, as a great question. I mean, in the book, I actually say that no president um, has been, uh, and, I, and I suspect no vice president has actually um, disclosed openly psychiatric treatment. Um, they tend to see ministers, like Bill Clinton would see a minister, or Barack Obama might talk to a minister, but uh, we haven't had people actually um, say that they're having psychiatric treatment. Um, so I think that's a, a really um, great question. And I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to it, but I mean, if you look at somebody after Eagleton, like George Dukakis, his wife's depression and her electroconvulsive therapy for that depression hurt his candidacy and it wasn't even him, yeah. right? There is still this, this idea that, you know, mental illness is associated with uh, unpredictability and erratic behavior. And, you know, you could, the person's got the finger on the nuclear arsenal and so on. Um, but we know that, I mean, we know wealth, fame, uh, power uh, does not immunize somebody from mental illnesses, but it may make it harder for them to get treated. I think that the Eagleton affair and then also the um, uh, other um, um, other famous politicians who've disclosed mental illness really um, also show us, though, that that um, we should give society more credit because they actually end up um, being more understanding than we would expect. So we'll we'll see. We'll wait. See what happens next. It'll, it's bound to happen at some point, and we'll see. May I ask you, what are you hoping for with this book? I mean, it's obviously written for a more popular audience, mm -hmm. is um, marketed that way, is so forth. What, what are you hoping will be the results of this book? Well, I would like the people who read this book to understand that stigma is not something that is embedded in our nature, that it is not natural to shame somebody else for their suffering. And if it is not natural, if it is cultural, that means we have the power to change it. Any kind of argument that shows that we can actually alter the way in which we have demeaned and humiliated people with a range of disabilities can point us in the direction of making those changes. The problem is that the history of battling the stigma of mental illness has been one of a roller coaster, an ebb and flow. We make progress, then we forget. We make progress, then we forget. Um, I really hope that people will see the stories in the book as empowering, uh, hopefully as inspiring, uh, and, um, and can accept that, that they're not normal either, that nobody is normal. You know, normal was once a mathematical term that meant 
you know, the statistical average. Uh, I think normal is fast becoming a, more of a derogatory term. Um, it had been a statistical average, then it became something to aspire to in the age of conformity. And I think it's, it's kind of like what my grandfather and my father discussed in 1962, I guess it was, in the archives of general psychiatry. Um, they went to a college outside of Chicago called George Williams College, and uh, it no longer exists. Um, it was associated with the YMCA, but I'm not sure exactly what its history is. And whereas everybody uh, in the mental health professions was uh, would, would come into a community and they'd say, okay, let's get the normal ones out, uh, out of our site and we'll only look at the ones who qualify for these various mental illnesses. They did the opposite at George Williams College, which is now defunct, by the way. This thing was all male college. Um, and um, they said, let's just look at the ones who who qualify, who meet criteria for mental illness, and then we'll remove them and we'll just look at the normal ones. And you know what? The ones that were normal were the ones who were boring. The ones who were average intellectually. The ones who, the normal ones were those that the University of Chicago press professors, when these kids were allowed to take classes occasionally, saw as weird. And, um, and uh, one word used by a, a University of Chicago professor was that they were uh, muscular Christians. Strange two words put together. Um, and um, my grandfather actually asked in 1962, it's an amazing thing, you know, years, decades before neurodiversity. And he said, is the, the lack of ambition, the lack of creativity, and innovation, the cost we have to pay for normality. He had to repeat the question twice to make sure that readers didn't think he was joking. That's where I hope we go. Yeah. I hope that this book is part of the larger um, movement toward inclusiveness and diversity. Thanks for that question. Well, I don't know how we're doing on time, but um, I leave that to my my hosts. Michael? Right. Well, I think that this has been a wonderful discussion, a wonderful evening. Uh, I thank both Roy and Eugene for joining us tonight. Uh, yeah, thank you, Eugene. Uh, no, thank thank you, you for inviting me. And Roy, thank it's, you for writing the book. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a great book. Ben, very enlightening. Um, and before I sign off tonight, I simply want to remind everybody that um, coming up, we have got, and I'm going to share my screen here in a minute. Um, coming up in November, we have got uh, the wartime experiences of another Hyde Parker somewhere in Europe with Roberto Lesnar Bernstein and Judith Lesnar Holstein, uh, the World War II letters of Stan Lesnar, uh, who was a correspondent. He was a journalist with the Chicago Daily News and also wrote the popular Hyde Park. Parker's all column for the Hyde Park Herald in the 1980s. The letters were discovered many, many years after um, the war and years after Sam had died. So uh, that should be a very interesting discussion in November. And then we take our Christmas or our holiday hiatus in December and come back in January where we will have the Guard Sisters, Gay Guard Chamberlain and Anair Guard. And of course, we hope that Sam will join us for sibling revelry, um, discussion and readings of poetry uh, by the two sisters. So anyway, um, as you can see, Roy and Eugene, this is kind of a varied book club. We 
We go in a lot of different directions. We are so happy that you joined us tonight. Um, happy that everybody who came tonight joined us. Um, this We have been recording this uh, session and it will be posted to our website in the, in the near future, hopefully. Um, so I will be sending out a message to everybody uh, with the link to the video. And we hope to see you all again in the future. And I bid you a very pleasant good night. Thanks again. That was wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate all it. All right. Thanks so Thanks. much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thanks.